invite you to turn in your Bibles to Joshua chapter 8. Title of the message, Covenant Renewal. Covenant Renewal. This morning you have heard the Ten Commandments. You've heard of the wisdom of God. And we've sung together of the glory of God. As we approach now this last section of chapter 8, let's be very clear that Joshua was not a revolutionary anarchist. He stood on the shoulders of Moses. It wasn't as though Moses was gone and now Joshua is doing his, his own thing. But what we see here is Joshua doing exactly as that which Moses commanded. For too many well-meaning men, I'm sorry, far too many well-meaning men, describe themselves as New Testament Christians and either implicitly or explicitly disconnect themselves from the Old Testament. This morning, we're going to see how Joshua built, how Israel stood, and how Joshua read. Joshua built, Israel stood, Joshua read. Joshua chapter 8, verses 30 through 32. Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord God of Israel in Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones, of which no man hath lifted up any other. And they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord and sacrificed peace offerings. And he wrote there upon the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of of the children of Israel. As we go to the Lord in prayer, I want you to just set your hearts to the victory that Israel just won in the preceding section of what we read. And how now, in light of that victory, they are looking on as Joshua builds this altar, a memorial to God, celebrating not Israel's victory, but God's victory. Let us pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you for the goodness of your word. Lord, we thank you that you didn't just merely drop morsels of bread along the way, but rather you preserved your word specifically for us, declaring, revealing the covenant that you call us into. Lord, we thank you that today we who call upon the name of the Lord identify with the people here in Joshua 8. to whom you gave victory over Jericho and in Ai, and of whom watched as Joshua did exactly as his predecessor, Moses had commanded, in building an altar to you, our God of victory, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
isn't it interesting? We here in the United States, when we go to war, or for the most part, when we go to war, and the boys come home from war, we throw parades and throw out ticker tape from the windows of tall buildings. We celebrate man's accomplishment. But here in this text, we don't see Israel celebrating man's accomplishments. Rather, Joshua led Israel by building an altar. Joshua wanted the people to know that not only were they the Lord's people, not only was this the Lord's land, this was also the Lord's victory. Joshua and Israel knew that the victory was the Lord's. What we see here in this text today was and is a sign of obedience to Moses' command. Joshua read the blessings and the curses of the covenant. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 11. And you'll recall from when we opened up this book, that very first Sunday that, that I preached from the book of Joshua, I just simply titled the message, And, because that last chapter detailing Moses' death, it appeared as though Joshua picks up the pen that Moses had formerly used. It continues the story. Joshua chapter, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy chapter 11, beginning in the 26th verse. Deuteronomy 11, 26. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. But turn aside out of the way which I command you this day. To go after other gods which you have not known. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God hath brought thee unto the land whither thou goest to possess it. Thou shalt put the blessing upon Mount Gerizim and the curse upon Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of Jordan? By the way where the sun goeth down in the land of Canaan, which dwell in the, in the, in the Champagne over against Gilgal, beside the plain of Moray, where ye shall pass over Jordan. To possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you, and ye shall possess it and dwell therein. And ye shall observe to do all the statutes judgments which I set before you this day. Look specifically at what he says there. Behold, I set before thee, before you this day, a blessing and a curse. The law and the gospel both are a blessing and a curse. To those who believe, it's a blessing. To those who do not believe, it's a curse. To those who obey the law, it is a curse. To those who obey the law, it is a blessing. To those who disobey the law, it is a curse. To those who acknowledge Jesus as Lord, the gospel is a blessing. But to those who reject Jesus as Lord, the gospel is a curse. What did Eric read earlier? About the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God to those who are perishing is foolishness. Israel stood. Joshua 8.33 And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on the side of the ark, on this side of the ark, and on that side before the priests and Levites which bare the ark and covenant of the Lord as well, the stranger, as he that was born among them. Half of them over against Mount Gerizim, and 
have them over against Mount Ebal. As Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. Verse 33, we see a why, a who, a where, a how, and a what. What's the why here? Why is it that Israel is doing what Joshua describes? Very simply, God commanded. God, through Moses, commanded that after they cross over the Jordan, that they would assemble themselves on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Who is in this presence? Who is participating in this? The foreigners, the native-born, the elders, the officers, the judges, all Israel is participating in this act of worship. All Israel is participating in this act of hearing the law. Both the blessings and the curses. And as we know from Romans, not all Israel is Israel, are they? There were those amongst that group that ethnically they were Israel, but their hearts were not devoted to God. Ethnically, they could trace their lineage back to Abraham, but they were not of the faith of Abraham. But both those of the faith of Abraham and those who are, were not of the faith of Abraham were present. Where these two groups, one on Mount Gerizim, were echoing the blessings of God. And those on Mount Ebal were echoing the curses of God. And notice how they're assembled. You've got Mount Gerizim, you've got Mount Ebal, you've got those echoing the blessings, those echoing the curses. And who's in the center? The priest. The people are looking, they're facing the priest. They're looking upon the Lord's covenant. So what is this? What is this that we're looking at? Is this just merely a historical event? Is this just merely something that, that Israel did in the past that has no relevance for you and me? Absolutely not. Every jot, every tittle is relevant for you and me. What is this? This is a picture of Christ's work. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke 23. Luke 23, verses 26 to 43. Luke 23, beginning with verse 26. And as they led him away, they led him, they laid hold upon one Simon, a Cyrenian, coming out of the country, and on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. And there followed him a great company of people and of women, which also bewailed and lamented him. But Jesus, turning unto them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me. But weep for yourselves and for your children. Behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear. And the paths which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, Cover us. For if they do these things in the green tree, what shall be done in the dry? And there were also two others, malefactors, led with him to put him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then, Je then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment cast lots. 
and the people stood beholding, the rulers also with them deriding him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. And a superscription also was written over it in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed at him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we received the due reward of his deeds. This man had done nothing of this. And he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest to thy kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Do you see the similarity between what took place in Joshua 8 and what's taking place here. Those present at the crucifixion, women, foreign-born Roman soldiers, Jews, rulers of the people, all the people are looking on Jesus. And remember who Jesus is. If you look at what the writer to the Hebrew says, Jesus is our priest in in the same order as Melchizedek. And this priest of the order of Melchizedek is placed between two thieves. One on one side, one on the other side. One is cursing Jesus, saying, if you are truly the Christ, then save yourself and us. And the other is blessing Jesus. Saying to the other thief, hey, both of us deserve this. This man has nothing wrong. Moses commanded thousands of years ago that when Israel crossed over the Jordan, that they would assemble themselves on Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, portraying that which would take place thousands of years later. Two thieves. One repentant, one unrepentant. One blessing the priest, one cursing the priest, but both of them in the center. Facing the priest and looking on the Lord's covenant. Joshua read. Back to, back to Joshua chapter 8, verse 34. And afterward, he read all the words of the law and blessings and curses according to all that is written in the book of law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before all the congregation of Israel, the women and the little ones and the strangers that were conversant among them. The entire law of Moses was read. Not just some of it. Not just the parts you like. It, that's what's different between Israel here in Joshua and most contemporary churches. Most contemporary churches, preachers stand up and they preach only those things that are comfortable. Those things that will give an amen. But what does it say that Joshua did? He read all of the law. The blessings, the curses. That which made folks comfortable and that which made folks squirm. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. And then verse 20. Matthew 5, 17. 
Think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Specifically look at verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Joshua was not a revolutionary anarchist. Jesus was not a revolutionary anarchist. Jesus fulfilled every single one of the laws that were laid forth in the Old Testament. He didn't abolish anything. All of the ceremonial law is fulfilled in Jesus. And all of the moral law was obeyed in Jesus. This is the law of the land for Israel. And here is the reminder of the conditions of God's covenant with her. The ceremonial law points to who Jesus is. Points to the work that he would do. The moral law is the law of land. And it shows the conditions for God's covenant with Israel. Today, if you are a believer then you are part of true Israel. The law continues. The, the moral law continues for you and me to present the conditions of God's covenant with Israel. It is through the law that you are being made right in this world today. Try as you and me may in our flesh, we cannot keep the moral law. But, as we trust in Jesus, as we surrender to Him as Lord, that moral law, through that moral law, He makes you and me right in this world today. When we started out this book of Joshua, we're looking at the land. We're looking at, at, at Israel's promise being fulfilled that they are receiving the land. The land for you and me is not a physical land. The land for true Israel is not a physical land. But the land for true Israel is being made right in this world today. So that wherever you and me are, we are being made right by the God who covenanted himself with you and me. Went back to that picture of Jesus on the cross. Going back to that picture of, of Israel standing on the two mountains, echoing the blessings and the curses of the law. And the two thieves looking at Jesus, one cursing him and one blessing him. Which thief are you? Are you the thief that mocks him, saying, if you're truly the Christ, save yourself and us? Or are you the thief that recognizes that you deserve to be where you are and that Jesus is innocent? He's not there on his own behalf. He's there on your behalf. Let's pray. Our Lord and our God, we thank you. We thank you for the renewal of covenant. We thank you that that which you promised to act 
each and every step of the way was fulfilled. We thank you that when the gospel writers and the New Testament writers wrote, they weren't yanking the rug out from underneath the feet of thousands of years of the history of your people. But rather, the New Testament writers were joining the people of the faith of Abraham on that same rug. Lord, we acknowledge your word, your promises, and your work through Adam and Noah and Abraham and Moses. The work that you did in your son didn't obliterate any of the promises that you made to the men of old. Indeed, that which you instructed Moses was a light in his generation pointing forward to the fulfillment in Jesus the Christ, the Son of the living God, who died that we might live, and who lives that we might die gracefully. It's in his name we pray. Thank you.